This next section is all about wall cavities. So in relation to wall cavities, I'm not going to talk a great deal about every kind of wall cavity you can possibly have, but rather talk about the general considerations uh, in terms of wall cavities uh, that, are, that are very important. So you can build with this. We're going to discuss in detail a standard brick veneer wall cavity because this project um, was a standard brick veneer. Um, so we're going to discuss that and there will be other footage on that uh, included in this particular wall cavity segment. But you can build a home from, you can have cladding on the outside, weatherboards are very popular, um, fiber cement sheeting is becoming more and more popular. Um, you can also have metal cladding, there are straw bale homes, there are mud brick homes, uh, it, it goes on and on and on, hempcrete, etc. So all of that will be unique. What is important to know is that every wall cavity must be investigated in detail. Um, so there are companies that run numbers that basically look at diffusion rates of all the different materials within a wall cavity to work out whether condensation is a significant risk in that wall cavity uh, and if anything else needs to be done and what membranes must be used and insulation and so on. The wall cavity is important and I'm telling you it's important because when we go to homes and there are mold issues and so on, getting into those wall cavities and investigating them is destructive and is sometimes not very easy to do and you can't see mold growth that happens in wall cavities because it's in the wall cavity. You can have thermal imaging cameras and moisture meters and so on um, and they certainly do help but they can't see through walls. If the moisture is not in that material that you're measuring or if there's not enough of a temperature difference that a thermal camera will pick up moisture in that wall, there can be significant mold growth in that wall cavity and you will never see it. We put our heads up in the bedhead against those wall cavities. We've discussed in detail in the electromagnetic field segment uh, what's in that wall cavity when you put your bedhead up against it and sleep against that wall is incredibly important. So wall cavities important. We need to know and understand about the different wall cavities and there will be, as I said, some segments here that will tell you in a lot more detail and a lot more excitingly um, what to do. But I want to cover the little bits and pieces that are not covered in these segments that you're going to watch in the other footage and we're going to go through a couple of photos discussing that. Um, so let's take a look at that. The first photo we're looking at here is a photograph of the gap between, not technically a wall cavity, but, but really is, because it's the gap between the window frame and your wall. So when we get a window, we are putting it in this opening, and then we've got a little gap. We've got the wall over there, and what do we do with that little gap? That little gap is really important because that's often where the cold air comes in, or the warm air escapes, or humidity comes in. Um, it's an important gap to deal with um, and there are different ways of doing it and in the past, um, like in, in this project, uh, that gap wasn't dealt with. Uh, simply on the inside an architrave was put around the window and that's all that was there between you and the outdoors, which is just ridiculous. So anyway, that has changed luckily and keeps changing with building codes. You now need to tape that gap. And we're, we're here, basically, we're looking at, we tape it from the outside. So there is a Sega tape that will run across the outside of the, um, uh, the building between the window frame and the wall, as well as the inside. So we're sealing it from both sides. But in between that gap, if you look at this photograph, there's a nice photo of the gap. And that air gap there between that you can see is sort of filled in the middle there. And we have used insulation bats. We've basically taken an insulation bat and torn off pieces of the insulation and filled the gap with that insulation. Now, it's very easy to use expandable foam. Uh, is probably the most common thing to use and take up that gap. I just don't like expandable foam, but it's a very good insulator. Um, and obviously that can be used. I just, I just really don't like that product uh, because of its impact on the environment and its chemical makeup. 
So we have chosen to use insulation fiber, very time consuming, but we tear off insulation, we put that insulation in the gap, we have then taped from the outside and taped from the inside, and that's how we take up that gap uh, in, more, in between, because that's not technically in your wall cavity, it is sitting on the side, it's this little gap that's not dealt with like the rest of the wall cavity is but really important, otherwise it becomes an incredibly weak point in your structure. So that indicates that one. This is what a wall cavity should look like in terms of insulation. There's a photo of that, we cover this in insulation as well. So there are the, basically that's your timber frame. Uh, a stud is the timber that runs vertically up and down. A noggin is the one that runs across. Um, and in between all that, we have our polyester insulation fiber that is cut and placed in that gap. Placed in that gap nice and snugly, without squashing anything, um, and, not and there are no gaps and cracks. And that's what a, what a standard wall cavity will look like, insulated well. If we go on to the next one, now we deal with insulation a lot. Um, so I'm not going to carry on with insulation, but this is just a brief photo showing you how the roof cavity and the wall cavity then come together. That white insulation is the ceiling. Um, and as it goes around the bend into the wall cavity, it's important that there is very good insulation there. So you can see there the darker insulation is taking up that gap between the ceiling insulation and the wall cavity insulation so that there is no, again, weak point on that join between ceiling and wall. We cover that in insulation, but just very important. Then in terms of the wall cavity, you will also see this is the inside of the building. <coughs> Excuse me, I just wanted to show the amount of taping that is done and how even electrical um, wiring and, and cabling that is coming from the wall cavity is very well taped and sealed because we don't want gaps and cracks between that wall cavity. You'll see all of the taping around the window there. A lot of taping and that's to take up all of the gaps and cracks so that we have very good insulation and so that all the money you spend on your insulation is not compromised because the wall cavity hasn't been correctly sealed uh, in terms of that membrane we've got on the inside of the building there. Again, not just a membrane on the outside, but it's a membrane on the inside, taped and everything in the wall cavity is taped up and kept in the wall cavity. But there's vapor permeability through the wall cavity and that vapor permeability, there's a lot more detail coming up on a lot of other footage explaining that in detail. The next photo is an interesting photo. Um, you probably take guesses of maybe what, what you're looking at there. But basically you're looking at a rat or a mouse carcass. Um, they are often found in wall cavities. Um, they tend, they can often die there um, because people have poisoned them or they can't get out and get water. Uh, whatever the reasons in this particular property in this project, we found six carcasses, a mixture between mice and rats that were sitting in wall cavities like that. Um, so we want to prevent vermin from getting in because that's what's in your house. Um, just couldn't get over those photos. The next photo just shows how you can bridge what we call a, create thermal bridges through a wall cavity and pierce uh, membranes. This was in the old, uh, this was from our project, but this was when we were demolishing and came across this. You can see these big, big nails um, through the timber and through the membrane. If you're going to compromise, we go up to so much effort in the new project, sealing up and containing that wall cavity with the vapor permeability through it. Here you can see in the old one that, that revolting foil um, based wrap, socking that, that we really don't like. And on top of that, very cold metal nails running right through it, allowing moisture, allowing cold to get through the cavity. Just no care, just putting a building together basically, but no care, no understanding about how you've compromised the membrane and the wall cavity and your insulation by doing things like that. So be mindful and look out for that. And this is what can get into your wall cavity. 
What we've done here is just take a little peek on the inside of the wall cavity. So it's a brick veneer. You can see the mortar there on the outside. And I just have my finger there where I'm peeling back the membrane on the inside of the building of the timber frame. And down there is all the debris and dust and insulation fibers and rubbish that builds up. Now remember our weep holes are down the bottom. So you have not only the mortar falling down and blocking those weep holes, You've got all the dust that blows in and gets into that wall cavity, all the insulation fiber that breaks down, the, the rice, and the rice, the mice and the rats that have been running around the we saw carcasses, their droppings, the urine, everything is lying in that debris in that wall cavity. Some of you might say, well, we never get to experience that. It's not a problem. Um, we'll never be affected in the indoor air, but you can be affected in the indoor air. There are power points there. There are many holes and, and a lot of air movement within that wall cavity so that that can get disturbed and find its way through many gaps and cracks into your building if the wall cavity is not contained properly. So another reason for containing the wall cavity. But that's the amount of debris and dust and nonsense that you get in a wall cavity that you will often not ever see unless you demolish a building after 15 years like what we've done. Again, we've taken footage where we discuss this particular model that we've made up. Uh, passive house builders have made it up to show what a wall cavity looks like in a passive building. Um, and there you can see that the white membrane on the far left hand side is the internal side uh, where plasterboard wall would go over that batten. Um, and you can see how much that is taped. Um, and secured. You'll then see the timber window frame that sits on top of this model. You will see some white taping that tapes up that gap. So as the timber is sitting on top of your wall frame, we then have tape that tapes that gap. And then on the other side, on the outside, we have tape again taking, taking up that gap. So we don't just rely on the membranes, but tape is put on either side of windows. Taping is really important to contain things properly. So you, really this is just important to contain things properly. So you, this is just to show you all of the taping. And then we have another membrane, that blue membrane, which is on the outside, and that is more permeable. Uh, that basically encourages water vapor and permeability uh, to a greater degree towards the outside, so that is encouraged to move towards the outside of the building and not the inside. So this is discussed in detail in other footage, but just a, a very nice photo there to show you, particularly with that timber window frame sitting on top there and showing the white taping that is there on either side, um, that that's very important. I just wanted to show you that. And this is another one, just shows you the same thing. Shows you some insulation, the black polyester insulation, as well as the wood fiber insulation that we love on the outside, the polyester insulation on the inside. You can see how much insulation there is from the outside to the inside um, that needs to get through. We use that wood fiber product above all of our glazing, um, but it can be used in different applications. But just showing you again, look at the timber window frame and look at that white taping on the one side and the white taping on the other side, indoors and outdoor. Outside part and inside part, everything's taped and nicely sealed. So it's like a doona, where basically if you're wrapped up in your doona and you're nice and cozy and tight, if your foot's sticking out the end or you've got a little gap on the side, you're going to get cold because cold air is going to come in that gap and then you've got everything else insulated in and you're nice and tight so when the cold gets in, it stays in. Um, so please just take some care, take some time and when windows are installed, ensure that they are taped on the inside and the outside so that your entire wall, wall cavity is nice and insulated and airtight. Otherwise we're wasting money and we're wasting time. So that diagram just gives you a bit more detail there. There you can see it again as if there's not enough photos but just trying to show you the exact detail of the amount of taping and membranes um, that, that are there. And there's another photo just showing you the outside um, part of the wall with that blue breathable membrane. Um, there is a batten then um, there to create an air gap. 
and you've got a piece of timber there battening on which the cladding will go, some lightweight cladding, be it metal or weatherboards or whatever it is. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an air gap between that and your membrane. And that's just to allow things. So if condensation, moisture, anything gets in, it's not sitting up against all the timbers. It is basically going to, it can run through air gaps and there's an airflow there. So air gaps, if there's one thing you can take out of wall cavities, it's air gaps, all right? Don't have everything in a wall cavity tightly up against one another. These little air gaps are essential, uh, in my opinion. It just is more insulation, because remember, air gaps are what insulate you. Um, it's more um, air that an insulation that, that the cold or warm air has to move through. If any moisture gets in there, it allows for some air movement instead of water or anything being compacted and sitting up against building materials and getting mouldy and damp. So that just shows you that's just another another diagram of that showing, showing please air gaps are important within cavities but air gaps must be sealed up when it comes to taping everything up. So we want our wall cavity to be contained and properly sealed but within that wall cavity it is nice to have some air gaps between things so that everything is not squashed up together. Now that is very generalized. We now get, there is now a lot of footage, uh, different pieces of footage that will discuss these wall cavities and details with more photographs as well as interviews. Okay, let's have a look at what a brick veneer wall looks like once we've stripped everything back. So this is our brick veneer. We have stripped down the socking or the, the wrap um, that, go, that we saw earlier over here, that foil wrap. The reason why we've stripped that foil wrap off is because of the conductivity in terms of electromagnetic fields. We have something that's conductive that is wrapped all around the house and we then have cabling running all through that which can conduct an electrical field in terms of volts per meter that we measure in, which we believe can be an issue. So that has all been stripped out for that reason. What we've got on the inside cavity, you can see that when they do the brickwork, they neaten it all up on the outside. But on the inside, you're left with these big wadges of mortar. Now, that's not a big deal because you don't see it. However, in my opinion, I would wish that a bricky would basically neaten up this inside section of brickwork like they do the outside. The reason being is because this brickwork all starts falling down. When we do put a membrane in here, which if we were able to in this retrofit, we would put a membrane here on, the, on this inside of the batten. We would put a, a, a membrane there, um, a breathable vapor permeable membrane, uh, just like what we've done on the roof. We are going to put an airtight membrane on this side of the, of the um, stud and we're then also going to batten it out and put a batten there and then put the plasterboard on. So we'll show that. But basically, in this instance, this is what we've torn out. Um, all of that, that foil wrapping. Um, and the reason why we don't like to have this mortar is because this mortar all starts dropping down and you'll see, as, as we'll see, let's look at these photographs. You'll see that the mortar has dripped down behind this membrane. Um, and what happens is it blocks the weep holes down at the bottom. So the theory is that if you've got a membrane on this side of the wall, if there's any condensation or water, that water will drip down on the inside, the brick side, of that membrane drip down to the bottom and go out of the weep holes. So the big that's why we always go on about weep holes, how they mustn't be blocked, how they must be not on ground level but raised up above ground level, at least, at least 100 mil, um, so that water can get out. However, you can see that if you've got big pieces of mortar here and then you've got a membrane sitting up against that, it makes it a little bit difficult but the biggest issue is down the bottom where all this mortar drips down 
it actually fills up a little well down the bottom and fills it up to such a degree that very often and quite commonly the weep holes are completely blocked. So why do you put the weep holes in when you're going to do all of this and create that issue anyway? Obviously if you're using cladding and timber cladding you don't have this issue but many houses of brick veneer and this mortar creates a big problem and I just wanted to point that out so we can see that. So now we've made a decision to say right let's take off this membrane but now all we have, we have nothing between the brick and this insulation bat that's going to go and sit here in the stud. And then we've got an airtight membrane here um, and then we'll have a, a, a batten and plasterboard there. So let's think that through because to get your head around this is really important and it's something I've struggled with a lot. But let's talk it through. If we do get any condensation or water or anything that comes through this brickwork and falls in this cavity it will go down and it will go out of the weep holes so that's not a problem however in this particular case um, we wanted this breathable anyway so we want it nice and breathable so that this cavity can get the water can get water out of it if there's any builder however because of this breathability it'll be pretty tough for moisture to get into this this cavity because we're going to render on the outside. Once again we're not using a, a cement render, um, we're using a lime based render, um, a lot more unique from Graffenstone. It's something that I'm very passionate and excited about but it will have a sealant on that is vapor permeable. So it will protect the render but it will not be like a cement render where it's completely impervious. So we're going to allow that vapor permeability to be there but in terms of water and moisture getting through the water and moisture is not going to get through because of the render um, so it's got to be able to get through all the render in terms of even vapor get through all the render and get through all the brickwork and then get into this cavity so that's that's a pretty low risk um, some would say highly negligible but that's what's going to happen in this case if we didn't have the render there would be a higher risk um, of moisture being able to get in through this brickwork. Um, not very high, but higher. So in this particular case in the retro, we're putting this beautiful lime render on the outside. We then have this existing brick veneer, and then we're going to have our insulation bat. Perfect scenario, we would have a vapor permeable membrane here, but we cannot get in behind and fit a vapor permeable in this retrofit. Unless you take these bricks out, you can't do that. So that's one compromise that we're doing in this retro. We cannot put in this membrane on the brick side of the stud. So, wall cavities. No, no. This, is, this is an area that I get confused about a lot in terms of vapor diffusion and the different types of materials. And from a mold point of view, we, we, don't, we can't see what's going on inside yeah. a wall cavity. Many houses are brick veneer, reliant on weep holes. If water gets into the cavity, can it get out? Yeah. Is it going to condensate in there? Is it not? Showers leak, all leak into wall cavities. We can't see what's going on in there, so we have to get destructive and take samples in the wall and so on. In terms of the wall cavity, here you've built up a model. Um, can you just explain where I'm sitting here is the inside of the wall mm -hmm. and where you're sitting is the outside of the mm -hmm. wall. So we haven't, we would either put, this is your frame, I presume? Yeah, so this is the external batten to pick up the cladding. Yeah. So whatever cladding it might be, whether it be timber or steel or... Or brick on the other side. It could, it could be brick as well, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and then obviously we have uh, a standoff batten for for the or sorry a spacer for the batten so a standoff spacer for the batten so that we've got a drainage channel for any moisture that might hit the fabric get behind the weather type and is this standard everyone will do this there's always a batten um, it's it's becoming more standard um and different systems require different applications um but in general it's it's probably not standard at the moment um okay yeah, so it, it, d it depends, like we have a code mark system in Australia for cladding systems and um, they all require slightly different scenarios, slightly different setups. Yeah. Um, so it really just depends on the code mark system that's being used for a specific project. Okay. Um, but a standard brick veneer home, 
Uh, a standard body builder, would you would you find a pattern no, between well, your wrap and your? No, because in a standard brick veneer home, you would you would have a 90 mil stud wall. Um, you would have a brick tie, and generally sort of 20 to 40 mil cavity there. Yeah. Um, and then you would have a brick on the outside. Okay. So and, and that's and and in most buildings, you will have a sarking material over the outside of the frame. Yeah. Um, and you obviously have weep holes in your brickwork to be able to shed any moisture that gets between the frame and the brickwork out of the building. Yeah. Uh, in this case, where where this wall build, build up is for a lightweight system, so okay. a cladding type system, yeah. like timber cladding or metal cladding <coughs> or something like that, yeah. um, cement cladding. So, um, and what, what the cavity is doing that we've created here is essentially creating that cavity that is in brickwork to be able to shed any moisture off, off the building fabric, yes. um, out, out of the building and away from the building. So in terms of, now, now comes a critical part for me, that's why I'm getting all comfortable and trying to, <laughs> um, this, this membrane here that's on the outside part, all yeah. right, and this is what I've gone through showing that we use all the Seager uh, yeah, membranes, yeah. this is a, a highly vapour permeable membrane or? A... Um, in, in, in regards to like the vapour permeability of different materials, I wouldn't say it's highly, but yeah. it is vapour permeable. It's much more vapour permeable than, than the inside one. Yeah. It is, yeah, that's yeah. right. And it's much more vapour permeable than your standard uh, sarking type materials that yeah. are generally used in Australian construction. Um, so th as, uh, in construction, there's generally two ways of building the fabric and it will be using uh, impermeable, vapour impermeable, um, diffusion clothes products yeah. like bricks and concrete and steel materials like that yeah. or using more natural plant-based products that are diffusion open, allow um, moisture, yeah, okay. vapour moisture to pass through them. Mm -hmm migrate to the outside of the building uh, and and create a more lightweight type structure which is what we're doing in, in, in this example and what we do on most of our buildings and, and i think I, this is what i learned from you in your passive house bible is that the vapor permeability towards the outside of the envelope needs to be a lot higher yeah, the yeah. Inside, so it encourages, is that correct? It encourages the permeability. Yeah, the yeah. Outside. So you've got vapor pressure for, for the majority of the year here. We live in a, a cool to temperate climate. Um, so the majority of the year, you're going to have higher vapor pressure inside the building than outside the building. Yeah. So that, that, um, vapor moisture is going to be pushed towards like out through the building envelope. Now, we have a we have a vapor barrier on the inside layer on the warm side. Yep. And the idea being is that that vapor shouldn't actually get into the building envelope. It should be stopped at the vapor barrier. Yeah. Uh, and it should be dealt with with the ventilation system within the building. Okay. But if you do happen to have some sort of a break in your vapor barrier, or if if it degrades or something over time, and you are, and moisture is able to get into the building fabric, yeah. or if moisture gets in from the outside, like if it, for whatever reason there's a little bit of a gap and some moisture gets in, you want it to be able to dry to the outside yeah. of the building. Yeah, that makes sense, and that's that's something I've tried to get my head around because. You know, are you air conditioning? There's different vapor pressures. Are you heating? How are you heating? Are you yeah. blowing air inducted heating or is it radiant or is it very windy outside? You know, it's always going to, this vapor pressure is going to be changing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in terms of permeability, you know, there's such generalized statements. It's what's driven me mad in research where it goes, I look at the material, it goes vapor permeable. What I've learned in all this research and this journey is that the rate of vapor permeability seems to differ so much. Oh, it's, it's yes, this is vapor permeable, and so is this, but this is so much less vapor permeable, and this is a lot more. Yeah, yeah. It just varies. Well, it's from the same with thermal conductivity <coughs> of materials. So you know, like like we discussed earlier, the thermal yeah. conductivity of aluminium is two fifty, of softwood timber is point point three. You know, yeah. and zero three. So and it's the same with vapor permeability. You know, some some materials like steel and concrete are very vapor impermeable. Yeah. And other materials such as timber fiber insulation or plant based materials fiber materials are much more diffusion open um, yeah so <coughs> so now yeah, i get that the, i was always taught um 
uh, when I sort of got, got on this journey years ago back in Germany that you want the outside of the building to be five times more diffusion open than the inside of the yeah. building. And That's a good number. was yeah. always um, also taught that if you use natural plant-based fibrous based materials then try to stick with those so don't mix your construction up too much um, and obviously we need steel in certain circumstances in our buildings as well but we try to stick with relatively natural plant-based fiber-based materials yeah. that makes sense because we hate as soon as it goes metal as you would have seen on there we, we had it even the foil <coughs> excuse me even the foil wraps being more conductive mm -hmm. I didn't realize all the metal that's in a building for us when you strip back a building and of everything except the metal uh, you sadly find yourself living in a bit of a metal cage yeah. because you've got Rio in the concrete then you've got a foil wrap you've got aluminium windows You've got the plasterboard, that whole system of putting in plasterboard is all metal yeah, bracing and so on. And if you actually yeah. strip it all back, uh, sadly for us, you know, the metal beams where you have to have them, the lintels, it's, it's a problem for us. It's too much metal. Thermal conductivity is high. Electrical conductivity is high. Yeah, well, you're talking about it from an electromagnetic field yeah. perspective as well, aren't you? As well, so, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's, we, we try, and I'm a big one, I'm trying to minimize metal, only use it where it's necessary. Yeah. So now I get this a lot more, this permeability being less vapor permeable, anything gets in here, it can go towards the outside. And that's why we're trying to move away from these non permeable house wraps. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot more permeable, we're finally learning that we need to be permeable, permeable towards the outside. Yeah, and, and the convention has been um, in, in Australia to use a, 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 a standardized sarking based material yeah. which is quite often got, got an aluminium basis to it or an aluminium reflective foil to it, yeah. um, which are, are, are quite vapor impermeable, um, yeah. so not diffusion open really in the, in the context, yeah. um, and then not have any um, vape barrier on the inside at all, so all that vapor pressure that's developed in the building in the in in the in the heating season, so in the in the cooler weather, is being driven to that outer layer of the building. And yeah. if you get um, uh, a, a, the the right temperature differential there, you have a, a really high risk of condensation, obviously, mm. um, potentially on the inside, on the on, on the warm side of your sarking layer. So you've got a lot of moisture trapped inside the building. Yes. And this problem was experienced in pretty much every country that's ever yeah. done this. Uh, you know, yeah. it, they they had these issues in the, in Germany in in the mid twentieth century and right through to. Um, mm. Canada and North America and New Zealand, they all experience these exact same problems. Yeah.